This is that suitcase on his horse and buggy. Isn't that amazing? So he started with his pedaling days and he and he and his and his and his radius got bigger, right? He went through all the little communities and then he was able to buy a, a Ford panel truck. He made enough money to buy it. So his radius got bigger. One day when he was in the Earlville area, he goes back home and he gets a letter. I didn't say an email. I didn't say a text. I said a letter from Howard Duckles. How many people in this room remember Howard Duckles? What was Howard Duckles? Banker. Banker. President of Earlville Bank. He called, my, he sent a letter to my grandpa and said, next time you're in town, I want you to stop and see me. So I don't know how long goes by. Uncle Mitch, Uncle Jordan may have been on the trip. I don't know. Um, he came to the banker and said, I got this letter from you. You want to see me? What do you want to see me about? He said, well, everybody here likes you. Everybody in the area thinks you're a good peddler, honest guy. We want you to open a store here in this town, in Earlville. And he says, well, I don't have any money. He says, well, I'm the banker. I have the money. So I don't, Uncle Miss, do you remember how much he borrowed initially? No. I heard a few hundred dollars, and at that time, um, it was the building's just on the street. You guys all remember the building. Um, uh, the, so they moved, uh, they moved to Earlville. They lived, my grandmother and he and the four children, okay, lived upstairs, right? Lived upstairs. Nine years. Nine years they lived upstairs. And then the, he would come down, he would still do his peddling. She would come down, my grandmother would come down and run the business until uh, he could get back. So they both ran the business. My grandmother took the kids off to school and, and, uh, and, and ran the business, became a really sharp, sharp businesswoman herself. Because my grandfather couldn't read or write English at the time. Okay, still couldn't until the day he died. Um, and then once he, once he got, once they had uh, the kids, frankly, I remember, Uncle Mitch, I was, I was brought home there as a baby upstairs, right? You, you and your mom, you and Aunt Marion lived there? Yeah. My mom and dad lived there. And as a baby, I was brought there yeah. before we had our house on Winthrop Street, okay? Um, so I just thought that the the uh, the Earlville the Howard Duckel story is an interesting one. Today, you guys, municipalities today would call that a Department of Economic Development, right? Howard Duckels did economic development in his day, right? Yeah. So this is nothing new. It's just Howard Duckels. I never knew the man. He sure seemed like he had a vision. And I think his vision probably continued on more. Yeah. Well, the banks had closed, you know, the Depression, 29. Good point. And then Duckles came when the banks opened. He was. Uh, yeah, because that was 1939 when they went through this. Right? Yeah, 1939 when they opened. I, I remember the building. I remember when they were putting the. I was just a little kid, and they had to put a floor in just like this. It was a. A hardwood floor like this in that building. Okay. The building didn't have a good floor. Right. So they're putting a new floor. In. So my point is, it, you know, economic Howard, Mr. Duckles saw a, a, a probably saw a hardworking kid, right? Hardworking family, good for the town, um, and uh, took a chance. You know, lent him some money, took a chance. And by the way, that money he lent him, that covered for the inventory, it covered rent on the building, and it covered the living upstairs, right? So it was all included. Um, so, you know, I, I, I personally, in this day and age, living the life I've lived and borrowed many of dollars in my life from bankers, no bankers did that for me, right? <laughs> <laughs> bankers would send me, a, you know, an email every month saying how much I owe them. Right? It was never. It was never one of these. You know, let's help a guy. Let's let's get. Let's make some changes here. So I think Howard Duckles de deserves a lot of credit for the Khalil family in Earlville. Okay. Um, interesting. By uh, interesting note here. This is one of the first stores in Earlville when he was here. This journal, you guys, to me is amazing. As a 67-year-old businessman now, 
going through the trials and tri tribulations of retail clothing in America, right? Um, this is his journal that they kept on a daily basis of how much business they did, okay? I, I opened up to a page, now this is going back from 1939, every day that he did business, how much they did. If you look before, I, now this is 1941, if you look at 1939, 1940, business was basically pretty good. When I say pretty good, I'm talking five, six hundred dollars a month. It's pretty I good. I have that book, I think. Well, the book is right here. Oh, you got it. I have it right here. I got a, some books like that. Yeah. It, it's, you know, this, this whole process for me has been very, very interesting. So, and so now I'm looking back, I'm thinking, oh my, that's pretty good, that's pretty cool. So I turn to a page of December. December retail is good, right? You do a lot of business in December. It's Christmas time, everybody's buying gifts. I looked at December, 1939. They had a great month, maybe $800 the month. You know, 1940, great month, like $700 for the month. 1941, December. Why was business bad? War. Pearl Harbor, if you look at December 7th, 1941, no business. All the way through, now as a, as, a, as a retailer today, I look at that and say, COVID, Pearl Harbor, 9-11, Pearl Harbor, it's the same. Business was tough for a year and a half for them. Tough, sometimes no business. The month of January, 1942, $50 the whole month. War's on, right? We got things we gotta focus on. So as a 67 year old, I'm looking at this thinking, that's pretty cool. I mean, I mean, not cool, but I get it. Right. So my COVID days, when we got when I'm in the prom and homecoming, well I'll get to later, I'm in the prom and homecoming business, dresses. They shut our proms down. You know, we got through it, just like they got through it. Right? You do what you need to do, and I think that's a built-in in who we are. You know, we, we just know that that's just, you got to make some changes. You just got to, you, you just got to do, you got to make changes and do things what you, to make it work for yourself. So then in the 19, now we're going to go, so that's the, that's the early Earlville days with my grandmother and my grandfather raising their four kids, running a business. And then um, my dad, how many people remember my dad, Louie? Okay. My dad um, went to the U.S. Navy, served in the U.S. Navy. After that, he came and he opened the Earlville store, or took over the Earlville store from my, from my grandparents. I'm gonna tell you, and my uncles probably can attest or, or change it or whatever, I'm not sure, but I think his claim to fame was he kind of brought it into the current day. Instead of a mom and pop store, we had brand names. Oshkosh Bagosh, Levi Jeans. How many people here remember, guys, PF Flyers? Remember PF Flyers? I thought it was the coolest thing in the world, but my dad had PF flyers. Yeah. You run faster and you jump higher. Okay? So, so it, this went on for years, and it was so cool. Tom, Paula, Loretta, Nancy, I think the PF flyers running faster and jumping higher didn't work. I think it was the PF flyers fault, but it, it, the whole concept wasn't that good. But I wasn't known as a jumper or a fast runner. Um, also, um, so that, so he kind of brought it into the and had a vision. He always had this vision of 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 doing better than than you know just keep moving forward, growing. You know, I think that's probably where I get my you know nothing was a challenge, nothing was a scare. He was not wasn't afraid to take steps. Moving on, right? He also was uh, helped in the Earlville Centennial in the 60s. He was a big part of that. Um, uh, he had a great passion for the Khalil family legacy, and he had a great passion for the city of Earlville. Um, and uh, and uh, I'm sure he's looking down today and very proud of what has happened with the Khalil family legacy. Um, 1956. Well, that's, this is another, this is one of the ads from uh, the Earlville store. Um, if you notice here, uh, work rubbers, $5, men's coveralls, a dollar. I mean, these are, the, these are the 50s and 60s that are, you know, interesting today for me as a, as a retailer. That's a picture of my, uh, my grandfather and my grandmother and my dad at the Earlville Centennial. Notice he has a mustache and a beard. They did that 
Remember they all wore, they all, you know, and your, your dad did, Paula had, yeah. had beards and all that. Um, and that's the story that's on the street, two doors down. I mean, I go down there today and it's like, wow, it's a little different. You know? <laughs> but this was, this was happening. I remember as a kid, this was exciting. Our, our high school bands or parades would go through here. It, it, it was a big part of our life. This is the family. My grandfather, my grandmother. I don't know what year this is, Uncle Mitch. Do you know? You had to be, how old are you here? This is Uncle Mitch. Stand up, Uncle Mitch. Turn, stand up. Stand up and turn around. That's Uncle Mitch. Yeah, turn, turn around that way. Probably uh, 47 or... 47? 47. Yeah. Uncle George, stand up. <coughs> That's Uncle George. <laughs> And, and uh, obviously, that's my aunt Evelyn, their sister, and that's my dad, Louie. Okay? Um, so, you know that book? Yeah. All that writing was done by my mother, and she never went to school. Right. Yeah. She, somehow, she learned to read and write. This book here, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, right, the journal. Yeah. Because my grandfather couldn't read or write English either. He had, all he was, he was a nice peddler, a nice man, right? He'd come to my store back in. You know, he, I was very fortunate, everybody. You know, he died in 1987 when I was 32 years old. I mean, I had a great relationship with Grandpa. Um, uh, very, very deep relationship. So I, I'm telling these stories from what I've heard him tell me, right? Um, so it's, it's, it's really, the older we get, the better the story is. Now that's, this is my family. This is my mom and dad back in the 70s. My sisters would kill me. Tammy, Dina, and my sister Sonia, okay? That's my grandma and grandpa at their 50th wedding anniversary. I don't know what year that was, but it was their 50th wedding anniversary. Probably in the 70s somewhere. They're at the, they're 70, at the Manor Steakhouse. 72. 72. They're at the they, Manor Steakhouse. 22 they got married. They got married in 1922. Okay? And that's my family at that time um, in 72. Okay, so now we move on to 1956. Amboy has a store. My Uncle George opened a store in Amboy in 1956. My Aunt Mona is here with him. She, they both were very, very influential in growing that business in Amboy, frankly, to this day. It has now moved out of Amboy, and his, my cousin, his son Mark, my cousin and his daughter Karen run the Dixon store called Khalil's Clothing and Printing. And, and Mark's wife, Renee, also works in that business, and his daughter, Kira, okay? In 1962, my Uncle Mitch, did she work at a bank for a while? Yeah, right? And then opened a store in Shabba. Shabba. Okay, and that was a year or two. That didn't work, so they opened in Mendota. Mendota stayed there for how many years? Uh, let's see. Dave, how many years Mendota stayed about, there? About 50 years. Long time. Six, 62. 62, long time. And no, no, uh, 62 is when we started. 62 is when you started. That's I have to have that here. To yeah. 95. To 95. So, yeah, 62 to 35. 30 some years. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you see the legacy is, is building and it's changing, right? <clears throat> well, here comes, here comes me, 1977, graduated from Bradley University. I know everything. <laughs> My dad doesn't know anything. <laughs> dad, you don't understand. How many days, how many, Tom Norton, Paul, how many times your kids told you today, Mom and Dad, Loretta, you don't know, you don't understand. My dad never understood me. I was right, he was wrong. So I stayed in Peoria, worked in corporate America for a year, hated every minute of it. Couldn't wait to get out. So in 1977, <clears throat> my dad had a little clothing store in Sandwich, just a men's clothing store. I came to him and said, and just hear this out, this, this tells you everything. I came to him and said, okay, I'm a, I want to quit my job. I want to open a clothing store, men's clothing store, like we have. But I want Water Tower Place, Michigan Avenue in Chicago, 
Oak Brook Center, or Whitfield Mall. Now, as a 67-year-old, I just had my daughter call me the other night and said she's a she's a stylist in Denver. And I, this all came up, this all came back to me and said, Dad, I'm doing so well, I want to open my own salon. I want to open my own salon in Denver. I'm like, oh boy, this is kind of like deja vu, right? <laughs> so uh, he, my dad said to me, okay, he's thinking there's no way I'm doing this with this kid, right? But go, you're a sharp college kid. He said, you're a sharp college kid. Go make an appointment with Water Tower Place, Oak Brook Center, and we'll talk to him. So I did, because I'm a college graduate. I know how to do this. So we have these meetings at all these places. <coughs> I find out in the meantime, <coughs> excuse me, he's doing a little research on his own, in his own little high school educated way, right? <laughs> um, and we meet with these people at Water Tower Place and meet with the people at Oak Brook Center, and I'm coming to find out that, boy, you gotta open all these hours. Oh boy, you gotta be there from eight in the morning until 10 at night, and if you don't, you get fined, and this and that, and the rent so much money, you gotta do something, whoa, this is, this is crazy. So, we went to, went to dinner one night, and he said to me, quote, I know you wanna go Oak Brook Center and all these big places, but if you listen to me, I'm gonna tell you something. This is a, a man with a high school education from Earlville High School, I don't mean that in a bad way, but he was street smart. He said, if you listen to me, I think you want to find some place in your lifetime that will grow. If you're at Oak Brook Center, it's already grown. You're not going to grow there. So if you would listen to me, now everybody in this room will appreciate this. <clears throat> he did his research, and how he did the research is his public knowledge of sales tax dollars spent in the state of Illinois in the category of men's and women's clothing. And he saw this exorbitant amount of money being paid in sales tax to the state of Illinois in a town called Oswego, which had 3,000 people in it. And a town called Lake Zurich, which had 2,000 people in it. He told me, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to each community for a week. I want you to go to the barbershop, go to the grocery stores, get a feel for the community. As a 67-year-old, Great advice, awesome advice. So I did that and we ended up opening, I opened a store in Oswego, Illinois in 1977. And you know what? <clears throat> Things were okay early on in the 70s. Remember in the 70s, interest rates were 18%. Uh, we had a lot, a lot of inflation going on. <clears throat> Interesting how it sometimes come back a little bit, right? But I remember those times where we're, 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 we're a new store, so it was good, you know. Um, I didn't know what to expect other than I worked the store myself every day, um, developed a life there. And then something happened. Um, there was a WGN, uh, Bob Collins, remember Bob Collins and WGN? Had a, 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 a series on about Made in USA, and we all. And my dad was an Americanism. I mean, he loved Made in USA. Everything had to be Made in USA for him, no matter what, right? Um, so we, I started my store being Made in USA. Everything was American-made products. Uh, he then, we got this call from a, a buddy of mine. Called me and said, "Hey, you should get on the phone. Bob Collins is doing this thing about American-made clothing, and there's no place they can find men's clothing American-made. You should get on and call Bob Collins." So I did. I called Bob Collins, I get on the air, I talk to the guy. You guys, business exploded, okay? CNN called me, came out and did an article. Um, uh, it, was, it was unbelievable how things were crazy and that was like in 1983, 84, 85 and business actually exploded and it stayed strong. Now the economy got better too, right? Um, the business exploded from that time on, and then in, the, in 1996, all you women probably know of a store in Oswego called the Jacklin Shop, right? Well, when my dad did his research and found out all this sales tax being paid in men's and women's clothing, 
There was no men's clothing store there. There was a women's clothing store there. So all this business, now think about this. All this business is being done by a women's clothing store and there's no men's clothing store in town? Hey, I have an idea. Let's put a men's clothing store in town, right? So that's what we did. Then in 1996, um, I take it back. Let me step back one further. That was in, that was in, uh, let's go to 1989. Business is really, really strong in the 80s. Like, really strong. I mean, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm the best retailer in the world, right? I know what I'm doing here. And, and my sister, Dina, who worked at a bank, she graduated from Drake, worked at a bank, and always wanted to get her hand in the family business, okay? So I called her, I said, Dina, business is growing here like crazy. Um, I opened up a tuxedo shop only in a local bridal shop called Wolfsfelt's. Many of you probably know Wolfsfelt's. I was the tuxedo supplier there in their store for 20 years. Dina came out of the bank, worked and opened the groom store. Dina's sharp. Dina grew that business to a point that we had another location and then Dina hired people to run it, and then I needed more help in my store, just like Karen is helping Mark in his store. Dina came and worked with me in the men's clothing store, and she was awesome, right? So it was her and I in the early 90s, and you know, economy in the 90s was great, right? Business was awesome. Um, and then in 1996, I was very, very close to the Pickerel family, which owned the Jacqueline shop. They came to me and said, we're, my wife is sick, we're closing our store. I'm like, oh no, you're the mainstay in this town. And he said to me, well, that's where you come in. I'm like, okay. So I inter, get my inner dad in me and like, I can do this. I can definitely, I'm 40 years old, let's go. I'm, I bought this building, 20,000 square foot building. Dean is gonna go in and run. we're gonna get into women's, which we never, we weren't ever in women's. We're gonna get into women's, Dina's gonna run that, I'm gonna run men's, and from 1996 on, it was unbelievable, right? So my, I credit a lot to the economy, I credit a lot to um, luck, you know, we need a lot of luck along the way, we had luck, and then um, in uh, uh, 96 through 2005, when this book was, was made, Again, business, I keep saying exploded, but it did. It just kept exploding every year. You know what I mean? So to a point where it was like, awesome, <laughs> right? This is great. So that's my store today that has changed. But at this point, I want to give a shout out to all the Khalil women, right? There's everybody, every one of the Khalil women had a touch in this family legacy. <clears throat> my Aunt Evelyn worked at the store at a young age with grandpa and grandma, right? Um, my Aunt Mona, wave your hand, Aunt Mona. Aunt Mona worked with my Uncle George for years. Frankly, probably would have known as the, as the smart one of the two. <laughs> Definitely the harder working one. Uh, my mom, my mom was very, very um, uh, helpful in helping dad run his business from a standpoint of support. I remember as a kid, um, salesman would come to the store and uh, next thing you know the salesman was at my house having lunch and you know mom and the salesman and dad are having lunch you know uh, mom was very helpful um, uh, my other sisters Tammy and Sonia <coughs> all worked with me in Oswego um, Karen Mark our Uncle George and Aunt Mona's son our daughter works with Mark in, in Dixon uh, Renee Mark's wife also works with Mark and Dixon in the printing part of the business, um, printing t-shirts and such. So is my, uh, Mark and Renee's daughter, Piera. Gretel, Dave's wife, Dave is our business attorney, we'll call it today, our corporate attorney. Can we say that, Dave? Sure. You're our corporate sure. attorney. We don't pay you anything, but you're no, our corporate no. attorney. Okay, and don't corporate. start charging us now, okay? <laughs> um, but Dave's wife worked for me. That's how Dave met his wife, right? So she, uh, Gretel came and worked uh, in my store with me in the, what, 90, when did she get married? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I have no idea. You should have fired her, though, before I met her. That's 
<laughs> anyway, Dave's wife worked with me and then met Dave and kind of lived happily ever after. Um, so <clears throat> after I bought this 20,000 square foot building, uh, frankly, I added uh, women's to it and added a coffee shop. And it's still there today um, in a different way because I used to remember I was in the men's clothing business for years. Um, and then in, 19, in 2005, we had our big anniversary. Let me step back one more, sorry. 2002, my dad dies. It was a big, you know, he, had a, he and my mom both had health struggles. Um, but my dad would come to the store every day, reminding me of my days with my grandpa Neymar, right? He would come to the store every day. Um, you'll appreciate this story. He would come in his navy blue blazer, gray pants every day. So one year, you know, business is awesome. I'm selling this high-end clothing, right? So for one year at Christmas, I got three new sport coats, cashmere, camel hair, ultra suede sport coats. Dad, wear these to the store now, okay? He was a short little guy, 39 short, so you know, I had a special order. I don't carry 39 shorts in my store, right? <laughs> but it was Dad, so I'm buying all these expensive jackets, and he, oh, great, that's awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It goes about a month. Here he comes, navy blazer, gray slacks. And I, you know, I'm losing track. I'm like, hey, Dad, what did you ever, did you, did you have those things altered or what's going on? He says, no, I like them. They're very, very nice. I said, okay. So I go to the suit department one day, and I'm straightening things out. I look up, there's three 39 shorts <laughs> hanging in the rack. Because I told him, Dad, these are like $400 sport coats. So I see it. You know, everything's computerized. We have computerized tickets. I see hand tickets, $400. So, uh, you know. I said, Dad, did you not like those? He said, great. They're great. But for $400, I just assume you sell them. I don't even wear them. So he kept going back with his navy blazers the whole time. <clears throat> well, then in 2002, my dad dies of a tough illness. And um, I'm going to relate a story to you that will kind of sum him up. After the, and I didn't realize this until, until later, after the war, he got out of the Navy. During the war, there was a company that was going to compete with Coca-Cola called Pepsi-Cola. If you had a, it, Mr. Nelson, you maybe remember this in those days, if you had a, uh, a uniform on, a serviceman uniform, you got free Pepsi. That was their marketing plan. Anybody had a uniform, they had free Pepsi. So he leaves and he says, I will never forget you folks for this. Growing up as a kid, and I never knew this, classmates, but we never had Coke products. We always had to have Pepsi products. I didn't know the story. So fast forward to when my dad was very sick, his last few months, he couldn't move his, he couldn't, it was sad, he couldn't move his muscle, he couldn't move his arms, couldn't move his legs, but his mind was sharp. And you'd ask him, what can I do for you? He said, I need an ice cold Pepsi. Uh -huh. okay. Remember the story, Dave? Yep. I need an ice cold Pepsi. So it, was, it had to be done a certain way. So he had to go get the ice cold Pepsi, put it in on ice, put a straw in it, put it up to his mouth, and he would drink. <clears throat> and all you'd hear was, oh, that's so good. And he said, this Pepsi is so good. Well, I'm one day you know, at the nursing home, and there's no Pepsi, but there's Coke. Okay, okay Coke, no big deal. Coke, Coke. I pull up my dad. This is a week, we don't know this, this is a week before he died. <clears throat> he wouldn't drink the Coke. Yeah. He wouldn't drink the Coke. Really? I said, Dad, don't worry about it. It's fine. It tastes the same as Pepsi. Nope. And he proceeded to tell me the whole story again. Now, that, folks, is loyalty. <laughs> we don't have loyalty today. Do we have loyalty today, Dave? Retail today, there's no loyalty. What's your price? What can you do for me? I'm the customer. I'm always right. But the Khalil family has dealt with this their whole life. We just deal with it in different ways. Um, I, just wish, I just wish my dad was here to see that uh, 2005 celebration we had at my store. I know Uncle Mitch was here, Uncle George was there. I think he would have been very proud of that. Right? I think he would have loved to see that. Um, so basically, <clears throat> the future. Where does the future go? Right? For the Khalil family clothing in Earlville, Illinois. Where does it go? 
who knows, right? If you had told me 50, 40 years ago, in 1970, 42 years, 40 whatever years ago, um, that I would be not selling men's clothing, I'd be selling that. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, oh, there's no way. I don't know anything about that, right? That, that just goes to show you how a legacy can change. You know, things have to change. It's been 140 years since my grandfather came to this country, right, and um, and started what he thought was a a peddling business with a suitcase, right? And now here we are selling prom and homecoming dresses, women's sportswear for the young woman. Where does the future go? Who knows? Who knows? But something tells me it's going to be different than it is today. And as long as I can live, I'm kind of looking forward to that. I have two very, very strong young ladies that run my store in Oswego. I have nothing to do with it other than pay the bills. But I, I can't sell this. I don't know what I'm doing. They do. So it's, it's, it's really encouraging for me to see how they're growing this business. And, and it's different than what I did. And I, I keep <laughs> looking back at my dad. I'm my dad, right? I am my dad. It's like, well, you sure you want to do that? You sure you want to do that? It's like, go, guys. Go. You fly, right? It's time for you to fly. I already flown. My days of flying are done. But I can support you up in the air, so go. So I'm very, very blessed to have good staff at my store. Um, and I want to conclude this by saying um, thank you to Chris for inviting me. This has been a good exercise to, uh, uh, to, to see and, 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 re and relive. Um, this American dream that <clears throat> Neymar Khalil started in 1905, we're all still living. I'm fortunate. I still live it every day. And... Um, I'm, I'm blessed to be a part of this legacy and look forward to the future. And I'll leave you with this. And Uncle Mitch saw this. I'm getting, I'm getting, you know, more in my old age, you start getting softer, you know. And my golf ball, Tom saw this. <clears throat> I have, I get them printed with the number 1905. 1905. That's a, the year that was very, very important in my life. And I wasn't even around, right? It was the year that Neymar Khalil immigrated. To America. I was a very fortunate young man, not knowing it yet, but I hope to think that I took the legacy and moved it to a different direction, and I look forward to anybody else that's going to take it to a different direction than this. So thank you all. If there's any questions, I can help. My uncles can help if you have any questions. Thank you, Chris. You've got pictures of your family. Oh, I got pictures. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was, yeah, we better show me, right? <laughs> so, so Chris wanted to know what my current family, now you saw my pictures of my sisters years ago, right? Um, so there is my picture of my three sisters and I at my daughter Natalie's wedding in September in Denver. This is Sonia, Tammy, and Dina, my daughter Natalie, and this are, these are my kids today. This is in September of last year, so it's the most current I have. My wife, Jo, my son, Alex, my daughter, Natalie, and my daughter, Jen. So with that, I would open up any questions that anybody has. I thank you all for coming out on a Saturday morning to Earlville. Paula, I know you got up early, but I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. So if there's any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer some.